Thank you for joining us for our next um, lesson in uh, accounting for non-accountants. Um, in today's um, lessons, we're going to be taking a look at the fixed assets section um, of the balance sheet. So we're still uh, over on the assets side of the ledger here. Um, in our last lesson, we took a look at current assets, uh, those assets being that are going to be retired off the books um, most likely within a, uh, the course of a year. Um, the fixed assets, or sometimes referred to as long-term assets, are a little bit different insofar as these are assets that the organization purchases, and um, these assets are going to be in use for multiple years. Okay, um, So these are the assets that um, you know go into running the operations. So common uh, ways in which these assets are classified include the following. Um, you'll have uh, you know, asset codes for your building. Um, if you have certain um, enhancements or improvements that you make to the facilities, um, those are referred to as leasehold improvements. Um, land um, is another example of a fixed asset. Um, and it's one of the only assets that aren't depreciated. We're going to talk more about uh, this depreciation concept in um, our next slides. Um, the machinery and equipment uh, that are used in the production or the warehousing uh, processes are another example of a fixed asset. Um, the furniture and, fi and office fixtures. And finally, information technology. Uh, these are all examples of uh, different ways in which you'll see fixed assets classified um, when you look at a balance sheet. Okay, so with the fixed assets, um, a very important concept that we have is the concept of depreciation. Okay, all our fixed assets are going to be depreciated over the course of their useful life. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, concept of depreciation. Okay, um, it means uh, depreciation, uh, one definition that we have here, um, it means that the expense of the asset is not fully realized in the period in which the asset was purchased, but rather it's expensed evenly over the useful life of the asset. Okay, so meaning that you know your P&L, your profit and loss statement, isn't going to take an immediate hit when you buy an asset. But rather, you know, when you buy the asset, it's going to go on your balance sheet. Then, over the course of the useful life of the asset, slowly that asset's value is going to be drawn down, and it's, and, you know, it's going to be moved over into the P&L at that point. Okay, so to that effect, Let's talk a little bit about this concept of useful life. Okay, so when you hear the concept of useful life, um, what that means is that um, from an accounting perspective, um, when an asset's purchased, uh, one goes about and forecasts how long that particular asset is going to be able to continue to add value to the organization. Okay, so you know, by way of an example here, um, if you have a, the company that purchases a new laptop and we envision that that laptop is going to be useful to um, its user for the period of three years. But after that three year time period, you know, the technology is going to be outdated. And, you know, at that point in time, it's going to be necessary to purchase a new laptop. OK, so um, we establish the useful life of three years. So. Um, you know, depending upon the asset, it might have a different useful life period. Maybe some assets are three years, some are five years, some are 10 to 15 years. It all depends. And there's a lot of information that you can um, refer to online that will kind of give you guidance as to how long, um, you know, a typical useful life for a given classification of fixed assets should be. Okay. So, with this example, um, let's say that this uh, laptop's purchased for $3,600 in the interest of keeping the math easy here. So that's, uh, we have $3,600 and we're depreciating that over three years 
or 36 months. So that means that each month after that asset is purchased, we're going to realize $100 worth of depreciation expense. Okay. So in here, we take a look at um, the bookkeeping that transpires. So when we purchase the asset, as we can see here, we make a debit to our IT equipment for $3,600, and we put an offsetting to our cash for $3,600. So we're increasing the fixed assets on the book. A debit, to, Remember, a debit to an asset increases its value. Um, all the while, we're crediting our cash. So when we credit this current asset, it draws its balance down. Okay, so that's the bookkeeping um, that transpires when we buy it. Then at the end of uh, the month, um, we got to depreciate it. So again, we're going to be moving a portion of that asset's value from the balance sheet over to the income statement. Okay, so when we book that monthly depreciation entry, we're going to be debiting depreciation expense for $100, and we're going to be crediting. We, now, it's one thing that might be interesting here. We don't credit um, the fixed asset directly, but rather we credit the what we call an accumulated depreciation account. And what this is, is um, this is referred to as a contra asset account. So um, what that means is that um, a contra asset, it still appears in your asset sections, but its natural balance is uh, going to be a credit as opposed to a debit. Okay, so when you're taking a look at a balance sheet, you'll see um, the fixed assets uh, balance, um, and it's going to represent you know the value of the asset when it was put onto the books when it was purchased. Then you will also see these accumulated depreciation um, accounts, which will all have credit balances. So on your balance sheet um, that you're looking at, they'll likely show up as negative values. Okay, so to get the current net book value of the asset, you'll take basically um, the net of those two accounts. You'll, uh, you know, you have your IT equipment account, um, then you subtract out the accumulated depreciation to get your net book value. So in this particular case in point, the net book value of this laptop at the end of the first month would be the $3,600 less the $100 of accumulated depreciation, leaving us with $3,500, okay? So, um, so that's the concept of depreciation and how it flows through our statements. Now, another thing uh, to take note of, um, you can have the situation where you have fully depreciated assets on the books, meaning that these assets have been on the books and were basically beyond the useful life of the asset. So, you know, their net value on the books is zero dollars. So, you know, maybe you're in a particular industry and you have a particular piece of equipment that you've kept up and maintained over the course of time. And maybe you've had this equipment for 45 years and the useful life was only declared at 30. So that asset, I mean, it's still, you know, in your shop, it's still, you know, adding value to your organization, but that asset's being carried at zero dollars because it's been fully depreciated. Okay, so why is this concept of depreciation important? Okay, um, depreciation is important because it helps us to honor uh, what we refer to as being the matching principle, okay? Um, you might remember this from some of your Accounting 101 courses. Um, basically, what the matching principle means is that um, you're always looking to match your expenses with um, their corresponding revenues, okay, in the periods in which they're generated, okay? So, meaning that, you know, we don't, in this particular case in point, we don't want to hit the income statement, going back to this laptop example, we don't want to hit the income statement for $3,600 in the first month, and then over the course of the next 35 months not have any um, P&L impact associated with that, but rather, being that this asset is going to be in use for a long period of time, 
um, we wish to basically take that expense and capitalize it, then go ahead and amortize or depreciate that expense over the course of many months. So it kind of helps us give, um, helps us obtain a truer um, income statement perspective on things um, by virtue of doing that. Okay. Um, you'll also, when we get to our discussions of the income statement, you'll also hear us or he may refer to the matching principle at that point in time too, because matching your cost of sales and your revenues um, is another common area in which you will hear that matching principle discussed. Okay. So the final thing um, that I want to discuss here um, as it relates to the uh, fixed assets is uh, what's called the fixed asset register. Um, so many uh, accounting systems that you have, um, you know, will, you know, you'll be able to maintain your fixed assets in them. And basically the fixed asset register is a report that details for you all the assets that the organization presently has on hand. Okay. Um, the asset register oftentimes will, you know, have the classification of the asset, its description, um, the value of the asset might be uh, incorporated into this report. Um, then um, if you're dealing with a large organization, um, you'll often also have uh, the location, um, you know, maybe which department or what, you know, section of the warehouse this particular asset is located. And where that's of value is on a periodic basis, um, many organizations will perform an asset count. So they'll basically print out this asset register, um, distribute it to the respective department heads, um, and you know ask them to you know go through the department and to make sure that these assets are still on hand, uh, to make sure that um, you know in the event that an asset was sold or it was damaged or it was stolen, um, you know the asset register can be updated at that point in time to reflect the uh, true asset position of the organization. Okay, so thank you for tuning in today. Um, if you find these video again, if you find these videos to be helpful to you, please uh, like and subscribe, and please tune in tomorrow for our next lesson.